opening government in this debate has unfortunately fallen prey to a false diagnosis. They've misunderstood the problem of why doctors overprescribe drugs, especially across vast parts of the developing world, which I think were the most important impacts when this debate takes place. They've secondly misunderstood how the HWO works and where its efforts can actually be most effective. I think that's going to be the basis, a false characterization on which they're unable to take this debate and why most of their cases ultimately misguided. Let's understand first why doctors actually overprescribe antibiotics. I think they're broadly right about why people do it in places like the United States. A bunch of really entitled rich people go in and say, you give me antibiotics now or I will be very sad. Yeah, probably true. Also, the United States probably will not change on either side of the house because they make all of their antibiotics in the country. They don't need to import them from other countries. Probably not going to comply with this in either world. They don't, they don't, like, the ban will not affect them. Probably won't change that. What about developing countries? That's the places that are often unable to manufacture antibiotics in their own countries. If this ban hurts anyone, it probably will be in developing countries. The reason that antibiotics are given too often in these places to the extent that they are, I think that's a little bit exaggerated by this team, it's because they have hugely underfunded medical systems, right? Liberia has 250 doctors for the entire country. They can't afford to pay those 250 doctors to the extent that during the 2014 Ebola crisis, some doctors had to work on the promise that other doctors would hopefully pay them back later once they had wages. Doctors strike left and right in countries like this. The problem is that there is a lack of resources to give better medical care, and at that point, it's much easier to hand out pills than it is to deeply investigate and understand each individual patient because there is a huge strain on the medical system. What, um, so yeah, they're right about developed countries. That's not where this matters. What is our alternative? I think obviously, if they're right that the HWO and the international community has tons of resources to just hand out like candy, presumably we should invest those resources in building medical systems from the ground up and just training people, right? There's no reason to engage in a cruel response of literally just banning people from having access to medicine. We don't think it's going to work, but even if it does, I don't think people are over-prescribing antibiotics because they're evil. They're probably doing it because they lack resources and they need additional assistance. So a ban and this kind of cruelty won't change their behavior because they're not doing it. They're, the, they're only doing it because they have... <coughs> like this is things like not sending doctors to countries, not assisting in pandemic responses. Those are the only coercive responses that the World Health Organization has to force countries to comply. I don't think opening government wants to defend those. No thanks. Even if it can be enforced on some countries, this is not enough to stop antibiotic resistance. I don't think the developed countries really need the HW nor do they need to buy antibiotics from other countries, so this doesn't affect them. Unfortunately, as they concede in their speech, the main source of antibiotic resistance comes from factory farms in the developed world, meaning that that's going to exist on both sides. I don't think that overprescription in the developing world is really the main source of antibiotic resistance. To the extent that they have any impact, it is incredibly marginal and not worth the cruelty that would happen if this policy actually worked. Um, they try to say that countries will comply because it's cheaper in the long run, but I think in most cases, when people in your country are dying, you're not thinking about the long run probability of creating a superbug. Just like when you're working in computer science, you're not thinking about the long run probability of like creating a super AI that kills everyone on the planet. You're probably thinking about the short term ability to develop cool apps that make people's lives happier, right? Same thing is true in these cases. People are worried about right now saving people's lives and the marginal probability of creating a superbug does not enter into the calculation. What does this actually do? It destroys the World Health Organization. This is important for a couple of reasons. The HWO is the like leader around the world in pandemic responses. It is the only reason that countries are able to coordinate across different countries. And as a result, both the funding of the HWO and the coordination saves millions of lives every year in the developing world. What happens on their side? Countries who are banned 
will be outraged and will leave the HWO. They will import antibiotics probably from other countries who also don't comply. This does mean, though, that these countries are less likely to call on the HWO for a crisis response. They're going to say, oh, that's not true because you really need the help of the HWO, so you probably will call on them. If that's true, the people who live in the countries will still be outraged. A huge problem during the Ebola outbreak was even when countries called on international organizations, the people on the ground did not trust international doctors. Why would you trust people who ban you from accessing medicine that could save your life? There was a huge disruption in 2014 um, when people in Liberia attacked a Doctors Without Borders Clinic because they thought that foreign doctors had brought <coughs> Ebola to their country. That is the kind of response that you're more likely to see on their side. Pandemic response gets much, much less efficacious because you need compliance. You need people to voluntarily be willing to get involved in these kinds of things if you want to stop pandemics. Finally, even rich countries will withdraw from the HWO2 because they will see this response as disproportionately cruel. They're kind of wrong because the HWO is not wealthy in the status quo. They have a massive, massive funding problem, and most of that funding is from developed countries. We think these countries are probably going to withdraw because this doesn't affect them either way um, because it's one of those international organizations that they don't have to listen to. Finally, if their response does anything at all, it will kill thousands, if not millions, of people. Why is this true? If the ban is enforced on a single country, even for a year or two, those people will not be able to import antibiotics, and every person who has malaria or something similar to that in that country will immediately die. The second and more widespread but less obvious thing is that the countries they will have to import antibiotics from are the other non-compliant countries, right? So they're going to disrupt the supply chain of trading antibiotics across borders. They're probably going to have to pay higher prices for it, which shuts a great deal of people out of the market. Notice that these medical systems are already incredibly strange. People are already unable to afford medical care, and this makes it much more expensive to provide it from them. Their response is unnecessary and cruel. We are so, so proud to oppose. I'd like to thank the Leader of the Opposition for that speech, and now I call upon the Deputy Prime Minister. Kia kia.
that forces these countries to put pressure on one another, we think there's potential for value. They claim that this isn't going to help at all because what we ought to do is we ought to give um, developing countries the kinds of resources they need to build up these situations. First of all, I've already told you why you need to give them an incentive because there isn't a political will by itself to change the incentives on the ground. This is part of the characterization that Alex gives you and that we give you too. But furthermore, we can just do everything they want to do, right? Like we can just help build up the kinds of infrastructure, etc. In fact, we create a unique pressure on the WHO to build up the, the infrastructure of these kinds of countries. So that about, we think it is fundamentally better off. But in the worst case, even if we think we prevent developing countries from using these, uh, from excessively using these kinds of drugs, we think that they themselves are better off, right? We think they, for example, the, the, the probability that their countries themselves are likely to, to follow into these kinds of disease um, are, are less likely. They claim that the countries that are going, that, that if, these, if, the, if we ban these countries, it's going to be very, very cruel to them. This is true, but first of all, and we tell you that we need to reproduce an incentive so that this ban isn't going to take place at all. We think it's actually cheaper in the long run to not use antibiotics ex excessively. Using antibiotics is really expensive, it's a drug, while just having better diagnostic techniques is free, right? But furthermore, we also think that the chances of a superbug are actually far, far worse off. At that point, we think there is the capacity for these countries to comply. It isn't a capacity issue, but there isn't the incentive for these countries to comply. And we give them that incentive, even if we can reduce those countries themselves from importing these kinds of disease. So if you think about existential risk as a whole, we do, in fact, reduce it. The second question, then, is what does this do um, for the world as a whole? So the primary argument that we hear is that this is going to entirely destroy the WHO because developed countries and developing countries alike will not want to comply. We actually think that there is a strong reason that these countries do want to comply, right? They want to comply, but they're only going to comply if they know that other countries will, and this creates a negotiating platform that may not necessarily be entirely binding, as they rightly point out the WHO can't be, but does create some kind of benefit. For example, regulations around the environment, etc., Kyoto Protocol, etc., have been actually highly successful because it enables these countries to coordinate on global policy making, right? They're not perfect, but they comparatively create benefits because we think they create value. Thus, we think it's highly unlikely the developed countries are going to pull out, especially because, they, as they point out themselves, those countries get a lot of value from participating in the WHO in terms of, for example, influencing healthcare policy, in terms of, for example, coordinating response to global pandemics. So we think it is highly unlikely that they're going to do this, right? We also think, for example, that developing countries aren't going to uh, no, not comply because this policy uniquely gives them a the resources directly to, to actually improve their healthcare systems and b creates a unique political pressure for, for to ask for these resources from these developed countries. But I'll take a few after closing if they have. So the premise of opening government at this point is that countries have a lack of a political will and their priorities are short-term in nature. Given this context, why are the countries likely to reprioritize rejoining the World Health Organization as compared to just creating their own versions of generic drugs? Wait, okay, wait a second. So if what you're, if, if the outcome on your side is they create their own versions of generic drugs, like we think that's actually in some ways a good thing. Because if they can create new antibiotics, which no country has ever done before, we think that's probably valuable. But we think it's highly unlikely. Creating antibiotics is really, really expensive. No one's actually done it before, which is why we are having this debate in the first place, right? If they're able to discover new antibiotics for the world, Great, like that's an additional benefit that we can promise to you on our side. But we think it's rare and unlikely, and the more likely situation is that they're not going to have this kind of situation in the worst case. Look, we think that the most realistic outcome of this policy is a world in which we now uniquely, even just the media spotlight that we create for these organizations, and these causes are better. Because systematically, populations around the world tend to underestimate existential risk. We give that value, and we think there is going to be a large-scale amount of political pressure to do this. And by the way, not all developed countries are the U.S. There are a large number of developed countries that actually do not produce their own antibiotics, and most of the time, they don't do, like, they can't do this, and different developed countries produce different kinds of antibiotics. At that point, we think for the vast majority of the world, they will be able to and necessarily likely to comply with these kinds of policies.
And even if they don't, we think that we will leave the world a little better off. We think it's highly unlikely, first of furthermore, we can just caveat this out, because the only way this policy is going to be passed is if all the world as a whole votes for it to be passed, right? That is the mechanism by which the WHO passes the policy. So the mere fact that they're passing this policy means that they likely buy in and they likely comply with this policy, but this creates an incentive for them to do it and creates an incentive for them for the value. So even in their best case, they have no chance of winning. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Deputy Prime Minister for that speech, and now to complete the first half of this debate, please join me in welcoming the Deputy Leader of Opposition. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We do not think that healthcare provision is something that requires a punitive system in order to ensure that people are uh, people survive. If people, if developing countries have the resources to avoid dying in the short term, they would, and it was cheaper to do so, they would already have implemented these systems. As Ben clearly identified, the only reason they're not in the status quo is because there's a lack of infrastructure and expertise to provide doctors rather uh, rather than just throwing pills at people. They think that they can access all these benefits on, uh, on their side, but at the point where they don't respond to any of our arguments about the internal incentives of the WHO and the fact that there's already huge funding deficits because developed countries have no interest in, co in doing anything about localized crises, there's a direct trade-off between the funding of that infrastructure from wealthy countries to less wealthy countries and the ability to provide those services, which means on their side, they're likely to get more of the pill dumping and less of the ability to build long-term sustainable infrastructure. We are going to be the first team to tell you about the current incentive structures in the WHO and the developing world, because this debate is actually about resource distribution in the international order and how that affects crises in the developing world. I'm going to tell you three things in this speech. One, what does the current incentive structure look like? Two, what changes on their side? And three, what is the alternative? But first, some weighing. They think this debate is somehow about superbugs. They give us no reasons that superbugs are on the rise right now, other than, oh my god, it's so scary, they might happen and we can't do anything about it. However, I don't think this is entire I don't think this is like that. There are pharmaceutical companies in the US that are constantly preparing for the next 10 to 20 years of uh, crises and constantly because they know that antibiotic resistance exists and comp the competitive incentives in a capitalist market means that you always want to be the first one to prevent the next strain of virus, which means that there are already R&D happening about superbugs. What this is really about is much faster and localized crises, right? Because when we're talking about crises that tend to be isolated in the developing world, like the Ebola outbreak, where developed countries are likely to shut themselves off and say, we're not giving you anything, we don't want you to travel here, you can go solve that problem by yourself, right? Because if it was truly a superbug, if it was truly going to be a pandemic that affected the entire world, the developed countries would probably try to go solve it anyway, no matter what the hell the WHO said, because they don't want to die either. The nuclear weapons example they provide proves that also they have an incredibly high burden. They have to be achieve a nearly 100% compliance immediately, because the nuclear weapons example they provide proves that peace agreements only work when literally everyone complies, right? That's exactly how nuclear weapons work, because as soon as one country decides that they don't have to abide, that means that everyone else who followed up the agreement it doesn't work. If one country doesn't comply, they all of a sudden have the ability to spread that virus to every other country because of the globalization effect that they identify. Second of all, way is a question of speed, right? You can't wait for compliance because resistance is something that develops very slowly, which means that R&D has the time to actually go effective. Meanwhile, meanwhile, crises happen very quickly. People die really fast from Ebola, because, which means that you can't wait for a country to comply over a year or so or several months before a ton of people die, which means that even if the, even if you buy into some of their, even if you buy into some of their impacts, the, in their future, there might be some stuff that, like, where bad hap bad things happen. We think that intervening actors, the pharma companies doing R&D to develop a new antibiotic, will solve those longer term things, whereas it's very hard to have people survive in the short term. So what does the current, so I'm going to move on to the current, no thank you, current incentive structure of the WHO and how they deck all effectiveness there, right? So the first thing is what happens in developed countries. We think that developed countries are already facing an isolationist trend where a lot of countries, not just, not just America, but also Australia, Canada, many parts of Europe, are seeing developed countries as a drain on their resources and international organizations as completely ineffective, right? So they're already contributing the vast majority of the funding, but seeing no personal benefits. Now, at the point where you force them to sign an agreement that says, oh, you're going to cut all the antibiotics, which are the entire reason your factory farms and have your agriculture industry operates, that's going to create a lot of fucking resentment, right? Like, that is entirely a reason why 
either you would completely withdraw from the WHO, especially since you manufacture your own antibiotics and you don't need to buy them from anyone else. But second of all, that's a reason why at, le at the very least you would at least stop funding it because it clearly the WHO is not acting within your interest. The next thing is how do pharmaceutical companies operate, right? We've, I've already told you how they are already uh, they are already doing research and development for the next strain of drugs because there are capitalist incentives to do so, which means they will provide them. But in their world, where you have this isolation of the few countries that aren't able to comply, that means that those countries are isolated and the drugs will never be sold, which means that the, the huge numbers of people are going to die in their world. There's a direct trade-off be between the ability to provide the infrastructure and the actual ability to want to fund these things. Uh, to want to fund these things. Now, what happens in developing countries? What they haven't engaged with is, is what Ben said about trust of international aid organizations. We Ben's given an empirical examples where in, in the past there have been large uh, there there have been large disease spreads where because international organizations are seen as punitive and conditional in the agreements that they enforce on the developing world, you don't have any trust towards even positive organizations like Doctors with Borders, which means you're far more likely to trust the local doctor who says, "Hey, we're going to give you pills to solve." your problem rather than the international person who's doing this like oh like uh, who has this like very punitive agreement and is trying to withhold drugs from you right and that key question of trust where you're literally rioting and trying to attack doctors is the, re is the reason why this is incredibly important they say that you have a negotiating platform like Kyoto Kyoto did jack shit y'all second of all they say that the WHO uh, has value because of diplomacy and security I don't think that the US or any other country gets di diplomatic advantages from like providing healthcare to countries in the developing world which they don't really need anyway because they can use their economic power to just coerce whatever the fuck they want. It's also not just about America, because during the Ebola outbreak, Canada and Australia shut down flights to their countries as well. Yeah. Look, we think that there's going to be far more trust on the ground when the WHO is seen as actually acting on the benefit of the world, rest of the world, is actually preventing these crises from happening in the first place. Ben Logan uh, already gave you several reasons why this compliance is highly unlikely because, it, uh, uh, because, because it's seen as a punitive model because people don't have yet the resources to, provide, to pro actually provide the healthcare infrastructure that will benefit, which means no, we don't think that's going to happen. Second of all, it's all on the antibiotic effectiveness, right? We think that, again, everyone sort of agrees on the reason that the antibiotics are already overprescribed. We've already shown you that superbugs are incredibly unlikely. They're, they're nebulous, they're on the rise, and they're unlikely. But what's going to actually get worse is in their world where there are going to be a few companies, that, uh, countries that are slow to go, that are slow com to comply. What do we think will happen? We think quarantines are incredibly likely, and quarantines massively exacerbate the death toll of local crises in a way that they simply can't solve. When you have this fragmentation of the international healthcare sphere, why are quarantines harmful? First of all, they stop aid workers from assisting in outbreaks because no one wants to fucking travel to a country where you can't actually get out afterwards because they're unable to leave. Second of all, there's not going to be a trust of Western doctors because you feel like you're being locked into a prison of yourself, which means that there's none of this kind of trust that they talk about, which means that you're not going to take medicine, you're not, you're not going to bury infected corpses, uh, corpses or take any of the healthcare uh, preventation things that you need to do. Furthermore, quarantines are used to shut off countries with diseases, which means that the U.S. bans travel so people with Ebola are just left to die. These are all things that are empirically proven about the way that the, 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 the developed world is already trying to distance itself from local crises, knowing that it doesn't do anything for them, especially when you impose punitive effects on both the de uh, developing countries that are not yet able to develop the infrastructure or cut the cost in order to comply, as well as the developed countries, which all of a sudden are not able to farm, do their agriculture in the way that is most effective. We we have shown you why the, why they deck the ability of the international healthcare system to serve everyone and massively exacerbate the death toll of local crises, which are the most dangerous things in this debate. Very proud to oppose. I'd like to thank the deputy leader for that speech and indeed all speakers from the first half of this debate. To open its second half, please join me in welcoming the member of the government. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> talks about super, or sort of resistant bacteria as a future harm that will suck. We agree with opening opposition that probably the West will to some extent be able to protect themselves and have a huge incentive to do so. The issue is, this is not a future harm. We see export of already resistant bacteria to the third world where they kill millions of people. 
people, we say this is not a future problem where we have to protect the West. This is a problem that we have to stop right now because millions of people are dying as we speak. That is the real problem that we need to solve. What we are going to explain in extension is simple. First of all, that the West... Uh, the Western countries are the violators here, and second of all, how they are currently over screwing over poor countries, and how that will stop under our model. First, a lot of responses to opening opposition. First of all, they try to get away with the idea people will massively opt out of the World Health Organization. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but that argument is absolutely ridiculous for three reasons. First of all, for the simple reason that diseases are not stopped by borders, which means that the only way to protect yourself as a country is at the moment you know that other countries are having regulations that are preventing diseases from developing and spreading anyway. It is the stupidest thing for your own country to opt out of the World Health Organization because you lose all control over diseases that will, at the end of the day, come to your border and affect your country as well. Second of all, you will not be able to trade with non-WHO countries because they have different regulations, which means you cannot export and import from those countries. There are huge economical costs to opting out of the World Health Organization and say that is something these countries will never face themselves. But third of all, note that opting out of the World Health Organization is probably one of the biggest sources of political backlash you can possibly face, right? Your population will be scared, both domestically, but also internationally. On the international scene, other countries will basically only talk shit about you. Like, we say there are huge incentives for every government not to face those kind of political pressures. We say that is not an impact they can, and they can incredibly sell in this debate. Then they said the countries are producing themselves from a sill, one necessary, and there are enforcement issues, so therefore a sill won't necessarily work. Several responses here. First of all, note that most medicines are actually produced in India, so that's just untrue. But also, what we say is not all countries have huge big pharma industries, right? These are billion dollar conglomerates which only exist in some countries. So therefore, even if the US is able to do so, the Netherlands isn't able to do so, England isn't able to do so, France isn't able to, like all these countries aren't able to do so, that, so that is just ridiculous. So therefore we say they aren't producing themselves, but then they say, ah, but they don't have enforcement issues. Note, first of all, the body maybe doesn't have enforcement issues, but as it is as a body that consists of international sta all, all different states, states definitely do have enforcement mechanisms, right? They can put pressures or sanctions, etc., and make them conditional on living up to, uh, up, to, uh, up to WHO guidelines. That is the same enforcement mechanisms that all international bodies, ha bodies have, and that might not be absolutely perfect, but that does work to a large degree. But second of all, what we say is we don't necessarily need to regulate countries. We can also regulate producers that are selling to these countries that are violating them. For example, blacklisting them, banning them. Or, for example, the fact that the WHO and WH doctors massively buy up antibiotics, as opening opposition said, to spread them throughout the world. At the moment, we're saying we're not going to buy from you anymore. That is already a huge incentive not to sell to violating countries in the first place. Then the last point that they're trying to sell you is the idea that this debate plays in the developing world because that is where overprescription takes most place because there are no doctors. That is just ridiculous framing for two reasons. First of all, this is still way less than the everyday consumption you have when eating meat or other factory products in the West. That, that means you're eating pills every day. That is nothing compared to a crisis where they hand out some pills that might uh, happen a few times a year. It is not pills. It is specifically factory meat. But second of all, note there are still large costs to, for example, having pills in these countries. Most of them still don't have access to them, like they don't have access to malaria nets, which only cost 50 cents, or don't have access to, for example, paracetamol, because in even though they're cheap, they still don't have the money to be able to afford these. But also note that the doctors handing out these pills for free are often WHO doctors to begin with that are in crisis in these countries. Obviously, they are exempt from WHO regulation at the moment. It's the organization themselves handing out pills to these people in the first place. So therefore, all their material opening opposition doesn't stand. What is the actual impact within this debate? First of all, note what are the actual WHO regulations? Given that it is a consensus body, it means that all countries have already agreed to current legislation as opening government said. But that also means that guidelines are relatively minimal. They're not that stringent that it is so hard to live up to them. It is a minimum baseline which we really do need to, uh, to, to meet to actually be able to prevent certain problems. Now, which other countries are actually violating them? It is rich Western countries for three reasons. First of all, because they have huge agricultural farms that mass produce cows and need to feed them mass medicine in order to keep them free. That is something that is different at the moment. You have only a few cows.
cows to begin with. It isn't, it isn't the food there. Second of all, it is because they have simply more consumption of this actual mass consumed food. That is a huge thing as well, right? Even if it's not just the production themselves, it is people eating significantly more and therefore taking away, uh, taking away more of this uh, uh, taking way more in way more of these antibiotics. But third of all, note that it is simply more access to medicine. First of all, the medicine themselves, as they can afford it, but also more access to healthcare to begin with. That is something that developing countries simply doesn't have. That, that is something that is way bigger. That is the actual intake of, of, of the antibiotics that these risky Western countries are doing. Why don't they care about overuse? For two reasons. First of all, resistant bacteria are contained within sterilized hospitals and aren't able to spread throughout society. But second of all, even if they do, there's a way higher level of immune systems because there's better sanitation, that kind of stuff, which means these, these, these bacteria simply don't spread. They're simply not a, huge risk. Uh, uh, not a huge risk. No, thank you. That means that these costs simply don't weigh up to the cost for agricultural industries at the moment you would live up to these guidelines. We say, what is the problem of that? Because, and that's why we need more enforcement. Because what is the impact? The impact is that they're right now screwing over poor countries. Note two things. First of all, bacteria spread globally and quickly through flights and people traveling, but also through trade, through food uh, being exported all over the world. That is how bacteria are actually spreading. And second of all, resistant bugs are, and therefore resistant bugs are spread globally as well. But also note, resistant is not a binary resistant bacteria. Very often you're resistant the a bacteria is resistant at the moment you don't have a strong immune system, or it is resistant at the moment you are, for example, properly fed. That is something that you don't see in many of these countries, because they are already mass creating the th third world. People are weaker because, for example, they have less food, they live in less healthy conditions, they don't have access to healthcare, but also these bacteria spread quicker, there's no sanitation, hygiene problems are significantly worse. Okay. And third of all, if they get sick, they simply don't have access to healthcare to begin with. Okay. These countries cannot protect themselves as the West can for two reasons. First of all, they're too poor to actually afford medicine themselves, but second of all, pharma companies simply don't help them because there are no profit incentives to actually produce medicine specifically for the third world. The impact is that they're currently already incurring millions of deaths and that, uh, and that you get more poverty as the countries remain in the poverty trap that, health, uh, that lack of health creates for them. Incredibly proud to stand in proposition. I'd like to thank the member of government and call upon the member of the opposition. Here, here. Yeah. understand something. The spread of resistance is speculative. We don't know which antibiotic is going to trigger a new genome. We don't know which cell is going to duplicate and form the latest cancer cell. The one thing we do know is that in the developing world, if individuals do not have access to medication like Tatanol and the most powerful antibiotics, they will surely die, whether it is of malaria, whether it is of yellow fever. These people exist now. To kill them for a future generation that we do not know and have no obligation to is a principle here, here. Not, is not very justified. So here's what this debate should be about. I think this debate is about a mitigation. This debate is about when countries have incentives to screw over existing health like healthcare regulations, how do we best ensure that they comply to some extent? But secondly, how do we mitigate the effects of them screwing over these regulations? Opening opposition spoke about the following things. They spoke about uh, the World Health Organization, people leaving them, so on and so forth. Here's why this is not very important. A, I don't care about the World Health Organization. This debate is about individuals. This debate is about where people live better lives. But the second thing is that they speak a lot about individuals as not having infrastructure. While this may be true, this doesn't take into context why countries are currently not following the guidelines that individuals have placed. So here's where closing opposition will enter the debate. I'm just going to explain why countries at present do not follow these guidelines. But secondly, I'm going to explain how they restructure in a world where antibiotics are taken away from them. Why is this the most important part of the debate? This is because it determines the outcome and the effects of the policies of the entire debate. Insofar as I can prove to you that things become worse, it should be enough for me to take this debate. But the first thing, I have two issues of response. Firstly, to the speaker before me. The speaker before me posited the following things. In the, so like, the, disease, the diseases form in the developed world, then they get really strong, then they fly across the border, enter the developing world, and everyone dies. 
Oh, I guess. But this is all promised. This is premised on the developed world actually taking the effort to rejoin the World Health Organization. All I have to do is prove that they are not going to comply. According to their own characterization, they have strong industries already. They already meet a somewhat of a baseline and they are also not very reliant. Given that context, I don't understand why taking away antibiotic production from them will necessarily incentivize them to rejoin these regulations, given that you yourself concede and expect that they can do this on their own already. So what is more likely to happen? In a world where they already have the capacity to produce their own drugs and the World Health Organization keeps them out, they are likely to produce drugs in methods and ways that just do not follow the regulations. Here are some reasons why. You don't, you no longer get the benefit of being a World Health Organization member, but number two, you have actively been excluded from that said organization. There is literally no reason for me to rejoin this organization. I have the capacity to produce these drugs anyway, and I'm already not getting the benefits of it. I think this largely takes out quite a bit of the benefits on the Gov bench. But the second thing, the entirety of the, uh, the entirety of Gov bench is framed on a future threat. So insofar as I can prove to you that we must prioritize people now, then I think that's enough to take out a large content of the government bench. So we don't know that drugs are going to be resistant. We generally don't know. Research is giving us multiple different conclusions. Stanford will say this one is happening. Harvard will produce say no cancer is being produced by this certain drug. We simply cannot come to a solid conclusion. So what do we then know? What we do know at present is that individuals need these drugs now, but individuals will die if you do not give it to them. Why should we prioritize these people over future generations? It is assured. There is a confirmation that we can definitely help these people, but there is no confirmation that you can potentially help the future individuals that the opening government and potentially closing government wants to prioritize as well. You don't know when this thing is going to mutate. You don't even know if the drug you produce today will be enough to incapacitate a following or a genome that produces then. Given this context, it is best to prioritize people that are alive right now, and those are the most important individuals. Have a seat. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just prove to you that uh, firstly, things become worse off. So the first question that I have to answer, why don't countries follow the guidelines? So here's some characterization. I think there is a premium on being a World Health Organization member. There is a trend across the world where individuals definitely want to join the organization. There is a huge push from countries like Malaysia, even Singapore, that definitely want to do it. There are benefits of sharing information, and there are all kinds of benefits of just being a part of the international community. What does this suggest? Given that there is a large premium on joining the World Health Organization, for a country to make the transactional decision to not join or comply with these regulations suggests two things. Firstly, the situation is really bad. It's not that they, like apparently Liberia has 250 doctors, I don't really know how truthful that is. But the second thing is just that the diseases they are dealing with are some of the worst potential diseases in the world. This is Ebola, this is yellow fever, things that need large amounts of prescription of yellow large amount of prescription of antibiotics. So what does this suggest? This suggests a couple of things. The need to respond to this pandemic is a constant in both worlds. You will still have these illnesses. You will still have these things existing. I'll take opening in a couple of minutes. You can respond to them. So what does this mean? So they have to respond, but the way in which they produce and respond is one that is worse. Here are two ways that they will do it. Firstly, they're going to try to produce their own drugs. So notice, how will they do this? It's not that it's unregulated, like opening opposition suggests, but rather with the political pressure that exists to come up with a solution, you have to come up with the fastest potential of getting new medication. I'll take you in a bit. So what does this mean? It means you produce drugs at a rapid rate with very bad research because you have to meet that political pressure. So what does this then mean? It means that the type of drugs you get in the world of government, it's not that they're unregulated, but it's that governments pass them off as being regulated, but they are horrible in nature because of the lack of research that exists with it, because of the strict time span that exists on them to like fulfill that political pressure. So what does this then mean? Even if, let's assume they have resources, let's assume they have really good research. The governments don't have those resources to maintain that healthcare system. So where do they turn to? They turn to private companies to produce these drugs for them. Why is this the case? They have limited resources, they have to deal with one over the other, and it's incredibly expensive to produce research. So the type of things that happen are the creation of monopolies from private medical companies in the world of government. These are the people with the most amount of resources to produce the best types of drugs. That's why GSK maintains a huge monopoly in Malaysia. So what does this mean? 
It means the type of access you get towards these medicine to be able to treat your decision or your illness, sorry, is A, highly inaccessible because it's likely to be more expensive, but secondly, it is also just not under government control. It will be completely produced by companies. So at the end of this speech, what has closing opposition told you in this debate? We have proven to you that the need to respond to a threat is a constant and the needs and incentives to comply with these things are not as important compared to producing your own drugs. Given this context, people will die in both worlds, but they die faster in governments world because you give them unregulated drugs and you lock them out of access. I'd like to thank the opposition member for that speech. And now to conclude the government case, I'd like to call upon the GovWeb. Here, here. Hello.
to leave the WHO, but right now there's an incredibly low cost to not comply to these guidelines, right? You say that what happens right now, let me just look this up for a second. Yeah, what happens right now is that developed countries want to compete on the international market, for example, by putting antibiotics into their cows and stuff like that, right? You say right now these guidelines aren't that high, but they are actually not being like punished in any kind of meaningful way in the moment that they don't need them, right? What we do now is we sanction these countries, we prohibit the sale of these countries, and the cost-benefit analysis in the short term, which is exactly what opening opposition talks about, changes massively, right? Because you know that on the short term, the moment that you don't comply anymore, you will either have to leave the WHO, which provides huge costs to your government because your population will be afraid, your population will be probably outraged, but also we say it's just a huge like risk on the short term when other countries no longer uh, comply to the regulations, for example, when it comes to diseases and stuff like that. But we say also simply like it being incredibly a lot harder to access the kind of antibiotics because you know that other countries no, will no longer sell them to you, even if you step out of the WHO, we say, that is still an incredibly high cost for these countries, right? So we say developed countries are much more likely, on the short term even, which is exactly what opposition is talking about, to actually comply to these regulations, right? To actually, for example, maybe suffer a little bit more loss in the agricultural uh, industry because they can tell their population, we are literally saving jobs, we are literally saving lives by doing this, because otherwise we will have to leave the WHO, right? We say that is the problem on their side of the house. And then closing opposition comes with look. They're probably going to leave uh, the, the World Health uh, Organization because, let's see, but yeah, what are they likely to do? <coughs> we say, the moment you do not have significant costs to actually apply this, that is the moment that you do not do this, right? They say developing countries don't do this because um, because they, for example, have to react to the price, which means they're going to manufacture cheap drugs and pass them off as regulated. For me, it's incredibly unclear if it's what true what they're talking about in opening opposition characterization is true, that these are countries where there are already an incredible lack of resources, incredible lack of information, education, why passing off drugs as regulated versus simply giving un unregulated drugs is such a huge difference in this debate. So, so in that sense, I don't really see their extension as very meaningful, but also I don't really understand why these countries are likely to do this in the first place, right? We say these are the kind of countries that are probably already too likely applying to these guidelines, right? Because it's about sometimes handing out pills in crisis times. I don't think that in countries where there is an incredible lack of resources, that if you go to a hospital and say, I have a cold, they're going to say, here are some pills, right? They probably say, maybe you should go back home. We are going to save these incredible lack of resources for somebody who is actually probably dying, right? We say that is something that happens in these countries, and that is something that doesn't happen that often, right? So what does David explain to you? Which he explains to you that the moment that these countries probably are very likely to comply because we change the cost-benefit analysis on the short term instead of on the long term. Second of all, we explain to you why developing countries are very likely to already comply to these guidelines because they simply use less antibiotics, for example, in their meat or for because, uh, because they simply have less access to these kind of antibiotics to put in their cows because they want to save it for the actual population. Third of all, we explain to you why very likely these kind of drugs are likely to be less produced in the developed country, which means that they are less likely to fly over to, for example, developing countries where they have weaker immune systems, they have worse hospitals, where they are more likely to actually become resistant, and these bacteria build up and build up and become much, much more deadly in the process, right? We say, not only on the long term, but on the short term, we solve this problem, we give governments a different incentive, we save the developing world instead of fucking them over massively, we say, please vote, close the government. I'd like to thank the government's whip for that speech, and now to conclude the negation case, and indeed this debate as a whole, I call upon the opposition whip speaker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.